and welcome to the Ninja Chickens channel. Uh, this is my funky house and many of you have asked me to do a little video on the house that we live in so I'm going to record something for you. We have a 16-sided cordwood house that is partially earth burned and has a living roof. So I'll explain what some of that means. The first thing is the living roof. You can see this floor and the floor above are covered in dirt and plants. Um, if you look at where the beam is right here, you can see that there's a very thick roof. There are layers of um, plastic and insulation to keep everything in place and not let the rain fall through the dirt. It's not actually soil like you would find in a garden. It is um, mostly, what is it called? Vulcanized or puffed? Late. It's rock that's been heated to a high temperature and it makes it very light. So it allows the, the water to drain through easily so that it doesn't hold a lot of heavy moisture on top. So I think it's 75% puffed shale or autoclave shale and 25% compost or dirt. And so the plants that grow up here have to have very small uh, root systems so that they don't dig down deep into the the roof and also be very drought tolerant because they may not get a lot of moisture. So mostly we have what are called sedum. There are tons of different types of sedum. So we can grow the sedum up here in different patches and get different colored flowers and different, different uh, fall colors. We've also got a few herbs up there. Thyme grows really well. Um, yarrow grows well. Their uh, drooping onions grow really well, so we've got a few different things. And the benefit of having a living roof is, uh, one, it cuts down on our carbon footprint. We're putting oxygen back into the air. It also has really good insulation. So in the winter, it helps keep us warm. In the summer, it helps keep us cool. And one thing that we found out that we didn't realize was gonna happen is after they put the, we put the dirt on the roof basically before we started planting things. It was about the same time as we were painting the house and all of a sudden we had no phone signal. And my thought, my first thought of course was, you know, what was in that paint? What kind of nasty chemicals did they have in the paint that makes it so that we can't get our phone signal anymore? But it wasn't that. It was just that the roof was so thick that we couldn't get um, as the electromagnetic frequencies, the phones anymore. So we have to have a, a booster in the house to get a signal but it also cuts down on the electromagnetic frequencies coming into the house. So, um, that is the living roof. Did I miss anything? Uh, the soil's four inches thick. Ah, the soil's four inches <clears throat> thick. That's called a shallow living roof. You can have um, a deep living roof, which is around 12 inches. And when you see like uh, big businesses that have a living roof on their ceiling that have trees growing in them That would be something that you could do with a 12 inch living roof, but the the shallow ones It has to be things that don't have a really deep root system and it doesn't support as much weight We had to have the the roof um, Specially engineered or signed off by an engineer to say yes It will hold the weight of this living roof because it is more than a standard roof It's, it's 80,000 pounds when it's wet well, 80,000 <clears> pounds <throat> <laughs> it's wet. <laughs> yeah, so it's heavy. All right, so let's move down the stairs. So here is a really old Christmas wreath. <laughs> this will go into a bonfire at some point. But here you can see what's called cordwood. So this is just like when you, when, if, you're, if you have a fire um, at home, a wood stove, and you get a cord of wood, um, that's the same thing here. Ours are just 16 inches long, so from here to the other side it's about 16 inches. We cut most of the wood from our land and let it sit out for many months to dry well so it would lose all that moisture and shrink before we put it into the wall. And you start at the bottom putting a layer of what's called lime putty, which is was sand, lime, and water. Right? Is that it? Uh -huh. um, Toby's behind the camera, by the way. It's, it's hydrated lime. <laughs> hydrated lime. Yeah. Sand and water. And we used white sand. Yeah. We used white sand because I wanted to make sure that it was as bright as possible. Because when you've got the dark wood and dark sand or concrete or something that darkens it, then the inside is a lot darker. And we already had so much dark wood, I wanted the sand to be as bright as possible. 
so you put a layer down and then you lay your your um, wood along it long wise so here let me do this so you guys can see I'll put it down here let's say these are two layers of your lime putty and you're laying it down and then you put your cordwood across it like this so this is the outside of the house this is the inside of the house in between there's an open space that we just dumped a bunch of sawdust and lime in the lime helped keep down um, insects from getting through and it also insulates the whole thing you just pack it in there so what shows up in the end is the white of this side the white of this side and the pieces of wood some people will use this um, as a way of creating a, a nice artistic um, display in their wood we've done a few things in the house we've also done uh, bottles from the outside they're clear bottles. On the inside, you can kind of see inside, possibly, is a colored bottle. So we sliced, we sliced uh, the short end off the bottle, the clear bottle, and then put the colored bottle inside of it and wrapped them up. And that way we have a double-sided bottle that was the same length as our wood. That allows, um, it, I mean, it's just fun as far as uh, brightening up the house and making it a little artsy and and playful. We also put some things in the lime putty occasionally. I think we have some over here. Yep, little nuggets of glass. There's some here and here. Inside, I think we have some amethyst and some other stones. So we tried to make it pretty. Um, one of the downsides of a cordwood house is you might be able to see here all these little holes are from insects. Uh, certain woods they really like and they've made little nests in here. It doesn't go through luckily but we have had problems with cracks like this or this if they weren't properly sealed letting through yellow jackets and for the first few years we did a lot of fighting with figuring out where the yellow jackets were coming from and sealing up those holes. Okay over here, one of the things that I said about the house is that it's earth burned. So if you look, we came down the steps to get to the front door. The north side of the house, the back side, is almost half, the first floor is almost half underground. That creates another really nice um, insulating factor to keep the back side warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer. It especially helps with the coolness in the summer. We had originally planned on doing the whole house in cordwood, we realized, one, we didn't think we'd have enough wood. We might run out of the, you know, the amount we needed to do the whole house. And two, the north side didn't necessarily need all that insulation and mass because in the summer, um, well, in the winter, the sun hits that cord, the cordwood and helps to heat it up, that, which keeps it warmer inside. In the winter, or sorry, in the summer, the sun is higher up in, in the sky and so it just hits the overhang which we have a large overhang. The sun hits the overhang and doesn't hit the walls of the cordwood, which keeps us cooler. The back side, the north side of the house, doesn't need all of that. So we ended up just putting in small walls to save us time and money. Okay, let's go inside. So in here is Leaf's room, and I'll show you what I mean by the earth berming. We had planned on putting the cordwood all the way up to here and that's why we had these big shelves but since we didn't need 16 inches of shelving or 16 inches of wall we decreased the size of the wall just did a standard wall it's eight now, inch. it is a little thicker than standard it's eight inches an thick. eight inch yeah. yeah um and now we have a nice shelf but um this down here is more of a concrete block wall mm. that is holding up the soil from the other side Okay, let me show you the inside of the cordwood. So the house has 16 sides. We have eight foot sections all the way around. It's almost a circle. Um, there's not really a reason that we chose to do that, except that we knew someone who had a house similarly and we really enjoyed the way it looked. We thought it would lend to a nice open space. We have a big open living room, dining room, and kitchen, which is nice for um, having gatherings, hanging out together. 
it isn't great for placement of furniture. <laughs> there are very little walls that have 90 degree angles and so it makes it hard to put your bed against a wall, you know, put your desk against a wall. We, we move things around a lot to try and find the right, um, the right placement for it, but we do like how open it is. So you can see here, does it show up, the sun coming yeah. through? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll show you in the kitchen later because that's where the sun is right now, but on the other side of these are white bottles, or clear bottles, and so that lets the sun shine through. Um, this one over here is one of my favorites. Um, my cousin sent me a fish bottle, and then we made some other bottles to look like bubbles coming up. We asked our friends to save some of their nice bottles when they had wine or, or drinks and send them to us, and then inside those bottles we have little notes from the people who sent them. We also put in fun things like this. This was a handmade uh, brick with a paw print in it that I think was from... My grandfather. He yeah, was, Toby's he was grandfather. Mason. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you look up, you'll see there is a crazy amount of geometry in the ceiling. We really didn't know what we were doing when we got into this. <laughs> so we didn't realize how hard we were making it on ourselves to have so much geometry in the house. But it, now it's just beautiful. But there were like 22 and a half degree angles <laughs> for many of these pieces. We got a lot of our wood, almost all of the wood from the local sawmill, so we were able to just get it raw and then bring in the, you know, the big pieces to hold everything up. Um, so when these were going up, we have eight large posts around the inner hexagon and 16 large posts around the decahexagon, hexadecagon. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what it is. The 16 sides. And all the pieces had to be shimmied up into place because they're very heavy. It was kind of like Stonehenge when just these large pieces were up. And was it this piece? This it was, one right here? It was, it was the one in the kitchen, but... Uh, the one of these one. large posts, as they uh, were, yeah, the Toby rafters. and a friend were shimmying them up these ladders to get them into place, fell on Toby's head. And he said at that point, he was like, maybe I should just quit here. Mm. <laughs> So, let's see, the floor um, is a concrete floor, and underneath is, um, well, there's, there's gravel and then rebar to keep everything placed, but within that rebar is many, many feet of tubes, water tubes, all throughout the floor, so that we can heat the water with our solar panel. The water goes into a very large um, water tank, um, water heater, so it holds all that heat, and then in the winter we can turn it on to pump the water through the floors, and that helps to heat the floors. And since they're thick concrete, they hold that heat really well. In the summertime, we turn it off, and because they're in contact with the ground, they stay cool. So that's one of the ways that we heat the house. Um, oh, I wanted to show you the glass in the kitchen because now the sun's really coming through it nicely. This one is the only thing that's not a bottle. I really wanted purple in the walls and I couldn't find any purple bottles so I got a purple glass, drinking glass, and that, that worked out pretty well. We tried to use as much recycled or um, you know, reusable materials as we could. We got our stove from the local Habitat for Humanity. All of this um, granite and marble countertops we got from a place that was moving and they put an ad in the paper that just said, we're moving, we don't want to haul it all, you come take it and it's yours. And so we went there and grabbed as much as we could um, and now have granite countertops. We had to, you know, put little pieces here and there to try and make it fit in some spots, but, um, but we, we were able to reuse a lot of it, which is good. We also have a really cool piece in the bathroom. So this centerpiece right here, you can see it's a little different than the outside, is um, an old piece of oak that was from Toby's brother. It was a nice, thick, large piece, so we were able to cut the circle um, into it for the sink and then just reuse this piece from their land. We ended up extending it to make it a little bit bigger um, with a couple of oak pieces on either side. So um, this is the massive water tank right here, and it's hooked up to the solar panel outside. So it's a 119-gallon tank. Mm -hmm. It was way off. Um, 
but still larger than the standard tank. Part of that is because in the summertime, it, the water gets so hot that it has to have a place to you know, cool down. Mm -hmm. um, if we turned on the water and, and didn't temper it with some cool water at the faucet, it would burn us because it gets very hot. So, so in the wintertime, the, the heat from the solar panel, or the heated water from the solar panel, um, gets pumped through the floor, through these right here, which we've got them all labeled, dining room, bedroom, and um, which area they go to. And that way, if we ever have a leak, which we haven't yet, we've never had a problem, or if we ever have some floors that aren't heating well, we can kind of figure out where it's coming from. But that's not been a problem for us. So the main heat we had hoped would be the radiant floor heating um, from the solar panels. But the problem is that on the coldest days, it's usually cold because it's also overcast. So if we have a run of six or seven days where it's cloudy and cold, the sun's not heating the solar panels, the floor's just not getting heated enough. So we ended up um, having the wood stove. We thought it was gonna be our backup, but it's actually our main heating source and the floors help supplement. So it's just a little stove, um, but for the openness of the house and, and how well it's insulated, it heats us up just fine. So yeah, Toby and I started this. Um, we broke ground in January, 16 years ago. Mm, no, no, sorry, 11 years ago. No. 12. We broke ground in January and then um, while we were doing some building, also continued to cut wood and put that aside for the cordwood, and then finished 15 months later. We were moving in. We still had little touches here and there to go, but it, was, it took us 15 months to do the basic house. The longest thing really was the cordwood, because you could only build up to a certain level before everything would get too heavy and start sinking down. So you would build a wall slowly, let it dry until it was hardened enough that you could build the next layer on top of it. Because Kaya was four, at three, between three and five at the time, um, I did a lot of the cordwood because I could lay a little bit, go do something else, lay a little more, do something else. And, um, but it ended up taking us, we started that first and ended that last. It took us the longest amount of time. The cordwood is amazing as far as insulation. It's a lot of fun. Well, you can see up here, I talked about, you know, doing little designs with it. This is one thing that, that we did, the little rising sun. Um, the biggest thing I think for the cordwood, for me, that is the negative is just the chaos of it. It's very busy to look at. If you imagine this whole wall being a solid color, and a solid, solid as far as texture goes, it's a very different feel to the house than the texture and the colors of, of the wood, which um, I'm actually not minding as much now. When we homeschooled both kids, both worked out of the house and were here all the time, toys and, and school stuff all over the floor, having chaos on the floors and on the walls felt like too much. But it seems like now that the kids are getting a little older, we both have our own workspaces, my husband and I, and the kids are going to school, it, it doesn't feel like as much. So we talked about actually redoing the cordwood walls and making... <laughs> Stop. And, and, um, and doing something else, uh, another type of sustainable thing. But we haven't yet. I'm not sure if we'll do that or not. For now, we really like it. Um, and that's it. That's our house. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Hey everyone. I realized in editing the house tour that there were a lot of questions I didn't answer. So I thought I'd come back on here and touch on a few things that I thought I left out. Um, the biggest thing is the roof. The living roof is probably um, the most different thing that we have on our house. And so I wanted to answer a few other things related to the living roof. Um, like leaks. Have we ever had a leak? We have actually had one leak over the bathroom and um, really it was just we noticed some water coming in after big rain and we got up kind of figured out about where it was and dug through everything. We dug through the soil, put the plants to the side, took out the insulation and cut out any 
plastic sheeting and found at the layer that's called bituthane, which is a kind of like a tar layer that is extremely sticky and it helps to um, keep the water out. There was one part in that layer that was bunched up a little bit and folded over and it was letting the water through. So it was simple enough, we just cut that out, put down another piece and then put everything back in place. But um, that was the only one in the 10 years we've been here so far. Living roofs are supposed to last for many years um, if you take care of them. There are some that are on houses that have been around for 50, 60 years, potentially more. I'm not sure. I know that it's a lot more popular in Europe than it is here, and I'm pretty sure there are some that are a lot older than that. Um, when we first put up the living roof, uh, it, my husband and I were doing most of it. We laid down, I think it was a sheet of first plywood, then a sheet of plastic, then the bituthane, then a lot of insulation. There was um, eight inches of blue board insulation, so four layers of two inch board insulation. And actually when we were putting it down, there was, um, we get a lot of wind up here because we're in kind of a little cove and it was in the spring, there was a lot of wind going on. So I was up here um, putting down the insulation and since it's not a big square or rectangle, it's a lot of funky angles, we had to keep cutting out little pieces to fit it all together like a puzzle. But if there was any wind, those pieces would get just pulled up and blown away. So we had all these big pieces of wood covering the, the puzzle of insulation that we had until we could put down the next layer. And um, I was trying to secure some things. There was a big windstorm coming and I was standing up here on the roof. I was the only one here at the time. And a gust of wind came and picked up some of the insulation that was holding a massive log on it. Picked the whole thing up and started coming at me. And I ran off the roof as fast as I could and realized I should not be up there. Probably until I at least had some help and the wind was done. But um, yeah, there's been a few times that we've had some pretty big gusts of winds up, wind up here. Actually, that time in particular, it blew a lot of the insulation off the roof all over the yard. There were pieces um, skewered on, on branches up in trees like 30 feet high. It was a crazy windstorm. But once everything got weighed down by the soil, it was totally fine. And as far as the soil, um, it's like I said, it's 75% um, a rock material and then 25% compost. So that allows a lot of the water to go through and allows for enough of the, the actual soil material for the plants to grow. But to get it up here, we were worried we were going to have to haul bucket after bucket of this material and that was gonna be back breaking. So we were able to find a company, a landscaping company that has a mulching truck. So they would have a massive truck and this really big hose and that's how they would blow the mulch around into people's gardens. And they said, sure, we'll blow the, the roof material up there. Well, they, they'd never done it before and I don't think they'll ever do it again because they didn't realize what it would really take. It actually destroyed part of their material because this stuff is um, so sharp and much more heavy than what they were used to. They finished you know, blowing everything up on the roof. They helped lay it all out in the right, you know, four inches all the way around, which was fantastic. But um, it's not easy to get this stuff up on a roof unless you have the right, the right um, equipment. But once that was done, we had to plant all the little um, seedlings, tiny, tiny little plugs we got. Um, gosh, I don't remember how many hundreds of plugs. It just so happened that there is about an hour from here a company that deals specifically with green roofing plants. They bring them all over the country, but they happen to be pretty close. So he delivered them personally, came to our little open house when we first opened, you know, first moved in. Um, it was a super sweet connection. He brought all these great plants and you can see some of them behind me. Hopefully you can see some of the different colors. We picked out as many that we thought would go well in this area, mostly sedum. Um, there were a few that are actually um, carnations that would grow like low growing carnations. Those died out over a few years. I'm not sure which varieties are still here and which aren't. We have many different varieties. They bloom different colors at different times. Um, they, some of them turn different colors in the fall. So it's really nice because it's like a quilt patchwork on our roof. But sedum is the most common plant. It has a low root um, 
a small root structure so it doesn't have to dig deep, it doesn't have a big tap root or anything, and it does well in drought. So we'd put these tiny, tiny little plugs, um, like a single tiny little plant in, and they just keep spreading out over the years. For probably, well for the first two years I know for sure we had to weed all the time. We had to keep the grass and trees and other stuff from growing up here. And we had to water it. We, we had a hose up here and we would just keep on watering to make sure that in the heat, hottest part of the summer they weren't drying out too much. After that, it's been maybe once a year that we get up here and we just make sure there's no grasses or trees or other things growing up here. The sedum, because it makes a, a nice thick mat, keeps seeds from, from taking root other than their own. Um, we've had things up here like a lavender plant. I'm sitting next to what's left of a lavender plant. It actually grew up here for, for nine years. Last year was the first winter that it didn't come through. Um, but, I mean, that's pretty old for a lavender plant anyway, so I've, I've got a few to replant. We've had poppies up here. I actually have a couple of nopal cactus up here that are growing really well. Um, and some things will seed themselves that I think will do okay, like violets are okay. Uh, the reason why I like plants um, like sedum is because they stay there during the winter. They don't lose their leaves and die back in the winter. And so if they don't die back, they keep that nice thick mat that won't allow seeds through. And that helps with, a weed, with the weed problem. So, yeah, it's pretty much um, maintains itself at this point. If there's ever a patch that dies out, we can easily add more. Uh, let's see. Obviously, since I'm sitting on it, we can get out and walk on it. We have access from the second story, and then we can bring, um, bring a ladder to get up to the top roof. But we don't have to come out here much. When we first moved out here, we thought we'd make a picnic area and everything and have a spot to sit. But once the plants fill in, you don't want to walk on them. So it's not really the best place to be. But we do have some stepping stones if we want to come out here. Um, what else? So as far as living roofs, some of the... Um, the, the pros of having a living roof is you can grow food on it if you want. We do have a lot of herbs and some people who have deeper living roofs, roofs will even have vegetable gardens and stuff like that out there. We could certainly put um, plant pots out here and they grow well because it's a nice sunny location. Um, it's great insulation. I talked about that. It's good for wildlife because you know we can grow butterfly and bee plants up here. We can put things up here that, that other wildlife can eat they can get up here and it decreases the carbon footprint because of all the plants that are helping to put oxygen back into the environment um, let's see one of the things I wanted to mention is yeah, Toby and I did build the house ourselves we uh, we designed it planned it and for the first six months he worked on it full-time I was you know back and forth between full-time mom and and um, and helping with the house but he was doing more of the physical labor after six months he needed to go back to work that's about all the funds we had for him to be able to be full-time on the house so he would work on it part-time in the evenings or in the after, or in the weekends and we had a lot of local friends who were carpenters and um, and electricians and things that could help us out if it weren't for the friends and the community this house wouldn't have gotten built um, or at least as quickly as it got built. We had so many people helping out when they heard that we were doing this kind of structure. They wanted to learn what cordwood was like. They wanted to help plug the plants on the roof. And so we would just put out a call. Hey, we're having a party this weekend. It's a work party. We'll supp supply the tea and the beer and the pizza. You come and supply the hands. And people would come out and help. And it was really, really amazing. Those were some of the best memories I have, of just people gathering and learning about the things that we were doing. and. Um, and just lending a hand in any way that they could. They also, we, we ended up with a yard full of things because people heard we were building and we were trying to do it with as much reusable or recycled materials as possible. So at one point someone brought us a five foot round tub. Um, it had a leak in it so we weren't able to use it and it wasn't really in our plans but we were able to let Kaya swim in it while we were building because we had this massive tub. We had sinks, we had... Um, cabinets we had all kinds of stuff anytime someone would see something they'd call and say hey do you need this which was really cool it just was a really nice testament to um i don't know you when you put that energy out there in the environment that um that it will be answered that it will come back to you and um really gave me a lot of faith in community and friends 
Um, one of the things that we were able to get, which I think is pretty funny, um, out of a dumpster was all of the wood flooring for our upstairs, which is the, the master bedroom. And uh, we, I knew that it wasn't going to be concrete because it's not on the ground. It'd be too heavy. It, we thought it'd be really nice to make it a nice wood floor. And there are a few um, you know, flo wood flooring companies in our area. And one of them, when they have just extra pieces or things that didn't turn out right, they toss it in the wood dumpster. And they always say, you can always check the dumpster if you need stuff. So we would go there in the evenings on the weekends and we'd pull out pieces of wood. So I can't remember, I counted at one point how many different types of wood are in our floor. And I think it's somewhere like 11 or 13. There's wormy maple, there's spalted maple, there's peach, there's cocobolo, there's black, there's cherry and black walnut. There's so many beautiful pieces of, uh, and all of them in different colors, you know, from one inch to eight inches wide. It's just a beautiful floor and all of that came out of a dumpster. So um, it took a little more effort to figure out how to put it all together, but you know, we were reusing stuff. So Anyway, I think that's it. It's mostly about, you know, things that I wanted to cover that I thought you might have questions for. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to ask um, in the down bar below or in the Ravelry group. If you're a part of Ravelry, you're welcome to ask a question there. And anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for joining me. Bye.